When people are divided on an issue, it is usually not because one of them lacks information. Especially not today, right? We have more access to information than any people have ever had at any time in human history. But even before that abundant access to information, it was still true that oftentimes, not every time, but oftentimes when people disagree, when they are divided, when there is you know, some difference uh, over something, it's often not because one of them lacks information. Usually they have the same information, but one of two things happens. One of the things that can happen is that they interpret the information differently. It's not that they have different information, but they come to different conclusions about the information they have. Or, the second thing that can happen is that they can prioritize the information differently. So they have multiple pieces of information, and one person says, well, this piece of information is the most important, and the other person says, no, 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 this piece of information is the most important. Right? You've probably seen this happen. It happens in families, it happens in marriages, it happens in churches, it happens in politics, it happens at work, it happens everywhere. Right? So let me give you an oversimplified example, though, of how, how this happens. Right? So... Uh, let's say a husband and a wife look at their bank account and they, they both get the same information. It's low. Right? There's not much in there. And one of them says, it's low. We need to quit spending so much. And the other one says, it's low. We need to make some more. Right? W- what is that? They got the same information. But they're interpreting it differently. One of them says, okay, because it's low, that means we're spending too much money. The other one says, well, because we don't have much money, we need to make some more money. That's what I mean by a difference of interpretation. Or here's what I mean by prioritizing the information differently. Same husband and wife, same bank account, it's low. They also agree saving for retirement is important. But one of them looks at the low bank account and says, we need to reduce what we're saving for retirement until we build our bank account back up. And the other one says, no, if anything, we need to save more for retirement. Otherwise, we're going to have the same problem when we're retired. Same information, different priorities. So different conclusions. Now, I'm not saying that in those scenarios that they're both right, or they're both equally right, right? Just because they prioritize it differently or interpret it differently doesn't mean that they, there isn't one that's right or one that's wrong. That's especially true when uh, it comes to more significant issues or more complicated issues, right? It's especially true, as we're going to see, when it comes to religious issues, In John 9, which is where we're going to be this morning, we're going to see both of these misunderstandings, both of these differences of interpretation, uh, or both difference of interpretation and difference of priority that leads to disagreement and division among people. But in this case, it's over, first, a theological truth, an understanding of how the world works, and then second, over... Jesus himself and who he is. So we already read the passage this morning. We're going to focus in the sermon on verses 1 through 25 of John chapter 9. And it's a fairly familiar story. It's a lengthy story. It's one of those stories I want to preach the whole thing all at once, but it's just too long. Uh, we'd, we'd be here for an extra long time. So I'm just going to break it up. And this morning, we're going to focus on the first part of the story. And here's what happens first. Hey, Jesus and his disciples are walking somewhere. And they pass by a man who not only is blind, but he was born blind. So this man has never been able to see. And... Seeing this man prompts his disciples, Jesus' disciples, to ask him a question. And the question they ask him is, who sinned 
such that this man was born blind. Whose fault is it that this man was born unable to see? Did the man sin somehow in his mother's womb and that's why he was born blind? Or did his parents sin and as a result of their sin, this man was born blind? Now, They have the same information about this man that Jesus does. But Jesus is going to come to a totally different conclusion. But before we get to what Jesus says about why this man was born blind, let's think about why the disciples ask the question this way. Hey, before we are too hard on them, right? Because most of us, our, our instinct is both of those are wrong. Right? But why... Did they think that either this man or his parents must have sinned for this man to be born blind? Well, where does blindness come from? Why is there blindness in the world? Did God create the world where children will be born blind? And that's just a natural, normal thing? No. The reason there's blindness, the reason there's cancer, the reason there's sickness and suffering and death is because of sin. When God made the world, it was good. Very good. But when Adam and Eve sinned, the consequence of that was the curse that brought thorns and thistles from the ground, right? The wages of sin is death. All the the things that are wrong and painful uh, and disruptive about the world exist because of sin. So, in that sense... They weren't on the wrong track. They understood that this man's blindness was a result of sin. They were right about that. But they were wrong to assume that it was the result of personal sin. His or his parents. If somebody gets cancer... That's a consequence of sin in the world, of living in a fallen world. But it's not necessarily a result of that person sinning. Right? Jesus makes that really clear. Not only here, but elsewhere also. So the disciples are right about part of it. Right? They're right that this blindness comes as a consequence of sin in the world. But they're wrong about whose sin is to blame for it. And so Jesus says, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So let me tell you why this man was born blind, Jesus says. This man was not born blind because he sinned. This man was not born blind because his parents sinned. This man was born blind so that we could see God work in him. That's why this man was born blind. Now, Jesus follows up that statement. We're going to see how God is at work in this man's life in just a moment. But before Jesus takes us there, he says in verse 4, We must work the works of him who sent me, that's the Father, while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, Jesus has already told us, this about himself back in chapter 8. That he is the light of the world. Those who follow him will not walk in darkness. Why does he bring this up again here? Now. Because this man who was born blind has lived his whole life in darkness. And there's only one person who can bring light to someone who's in that kind of darkness. And that's Jesus, the light of the world. The the miracle that Jesus is about to work is also a parable. He's going to perform a real, physical miracle. He's going to heal this man's blindness. But in doing so, he's not simply going to be showing us that he has power over our physical bodies, ability to heal us physically. He's also going to be teaching us something spiritually about what He can do for our souls. That He can bring light 
to those not only in physical darkness, but also those in spiritual darkness. That also comes as a result of sin. Remember, Matthew tells us in his gospel that when Jesus came to Galilee in Matthew chapter 4, that it was a fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy that those who live in a land of deep darkness, on them a light would dawn. It wasn't that the sun didn't shine in Galilee. There was a spiritual darkness there. And Jesus came to bring light. So he says, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And then, verse 6, having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Now, Jesus performs miracles multiple different ways. Right? And I suspect part of the reason why he does that is so we don't think there's some kind of magic formula that he knows that if we knew, we could do the same thing. Right? It's not like, you know, if you copy Jesus' movements, then you can accomplish the same miracles. That's not how it works. In this instance, though, when he uh, spits on the ground and makes mud and puts it on the man's eyes, it's probably meant as a reminder that God formed the first man out of the dust. And Jesus is able to heal this man, whose eyes have never worked properly, by taking the same dust from which he made the first man, putting it on his eyes, and recreating, as it were, his eyes, restoring the sight that he's never had. It's, a, I think, another subtle hint that Jesus here is performing this miracle not merely as a prophet but as God in the flesh. He is repeating in a sense God's work of creation in restoring this man's sight from the dust of the earth. And it's an extraordinary miracle. This is not the only blind man that Jesus healed but this one stands out because this man was born blind. In fact, the man himself is later going to say in verse 32, never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. This miracle is utterly unique in other words. There have been other instances of people healing someone born blind, perhaps, or someone who was blind, perhaps, but to heal someone who was born blind, Only God can do that. Only Jesus can do that because Jesus is God. But again, this miracle is also a parable. If Jesus can open the eyes of a man who's lived his whole life in darkness, he can bring light to you and to me. No matter how dark your life has been, no matter how long, It's been dark. There's no one so lost in the darkness that the light of the world can't bring light to their life. No one. Now, this extraordinary miracle that Jesus performs prompts more division, misunderstanding, and opposition. The same kind of thing that's been going on is going to happen again with just a new twist. So as this man comes back seeing the people who know him, his neighbors, it says in verse 8, the neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? They see him come into town seeing and they think, wait a minute, this is the guy who used to have to sit on the side of the street and beg because he couldn't work, because he couldn't see. But now he can see, it seems. But some of the people said, yeah, that's got to be him. Others said, no, he he looks like that guy, but it can't be him, right? I don't think it's him. But the man himself kept saying, it's me, right? I'm the man, same guy. So... They said, okay, well then how are your eyes opened? 
It's the same question you and I would ask if we were in that place. Okay, if it's you, tell us the story. How did you get like this? How did this happen? Who healed you? And so he recounts for them what happened. That this man called Jesus made mud, anointed my eyes, told me to go and wash. So I did, and now I can see. And they say, okay, well, where's that guy? I don't know. So, verse 13, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been born blind. And we just, we know things are going to go bad at this point, right? Because we know the Pharisees are already hostile to Jesus. They're not open to him. They're they're not genuine inquirers, right? They are opposed to Jesus. They're trying to entrap Jesus. And so... When they bring him to Jesus, we get this, or they bring, uh, excuse me, they bring this man to the Pharisees, we get this new piece of information we didn't have yet, that also kind of like causes a, a weight to kind of sit in our belly when we hear it. Verse 14, now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. We're like, oh man, we know where this is going. So this is where we see a division based on which information you prioritize. Okay, so we know that Jesus just healed a man who was blind from birth. Nobody's ever done anything like that. But we also know that he did it on a Sabbath day. We've got those two pieces of information. Here's how the Pharisees respond. Verse 15 says the Pharisees asked him how he had received his sight. It tells the story again. And so it says some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. The only piece of information that matters to them is that Jesus did this on the Sabbath. And they take that piece of information and they say, That's all we need to know. He can't be from God because he's broken the Sabbath. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, at least a couple of things. One, did Jesus break the Sabbath? No. Jesus never broke the Sabbath. Jesus tells us that he did not come right to break the law or subvert the law. He came to fulfill the law. What is the Sabbath for, though? The Sabbath is for man to rest, right? Reflect on who God is. What is Jesus doing here? He gives this man rest, in a sense. He relieves him of the darkness he's lived in his whole life. Now, the Pharisees, are they saying, okay, well, you spit on the ground and made mud, that's work? Maybe. Are they saying any kind of Uh, healing, that's work and shouldn't be done on the Sabbath? Maybe. Whichever one of those, or possibly both of those, they're wrong. They're misunderstanding, misinterpreting the Sabbath, misunderstanding Jesus, but by their understanding, their reckoning, they think Jesus has broken the Sabbath, and so for them, that trumps everything else. It's all that matters. But there's another way to prioritize this information. Even if you're not sure, well, was it okay for him to do that on the Sabbath? You know, does that count as work? I, uh, I don't know. Even if you're not sure. Here's what some others say. Middle of verse 16. But others said, and these also may have been some of the Pharisees, because it says, some of the Pharisees said, and then it said, but others said. So maybe some of the Pharisees are on the right track here. But in either case, some other people said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? So they aren't prioritizing the fact that it was done on the Sabbath. They're saying, okay, well, let's look at the miracle. Let's look at the fact that a man who was born blind can now see. Can we explain that in any other way than that this man must be in some way or another from God? If he was a sinner, if he was a rebel against God, 
Not a sin, I don't, here when they say, could a sinner do such things? I don't think they mean anyone who's ever sinned, right? Because they would be saying no, no man can do this, which, you know, they wouldn't be on the wrong track there. But I think what they mean is someone who's like in rebellion against God, someone who's breaking the Sabbath, breaking the law, you know, doing things that God said uh, not to do. Could a person like that do this kind of miracle? I don't think so. That's what they're saying. And in this case, we know which one of them is right. We know which one has the right priorities. It's kind of like when Jesus was accused of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul, the prince of demons. And Jesus says, guys, that doesn't even make any sense. If I'm casting out demons by the prince of demons, then Satan's at war with himself and his kingdom is going to fall. Why would he even do that? Doesn't it make more sense to come to the conclusion that I must be casting out demons by the finger of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit? That makes a lot more sense. Same thing here. Do you think this man who's able to do what nobody else has ever been able to do is somehow a rebellious lawbreaker, shaking his fist at God, but also doing the kinds of things that only God can enable somebody to do? I don't think so. But there was a division because of this at the end of verse 16. There was a division among them. They couldn't agree. So they asked the man again, what do you think? What do you say? After all, you're the one that got healed. What do you say about this guy? And he said, he's a prophet. Now, is that right or wrong? It's right. It's not the whole truth. Jesus is more than a prophet. But it's better than some of the Pharisees are doing. Right? They think he's a law-breaking rebel against God. This man, at least, well, he's got to at least be a prophet. Right? Because only, I mean, in the Old Testament, prophets can do things like this. Or God, God does them through him. So it makes sense. Man hasn't spent a lot of time with Jesus yet. He doesn't know a whole lot about him. But he's on the right track. But they're not satisfied with this. They keep digging. And in fact, verse 18 says, The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight. So they, they're skeptical about the miracle itself. They're not even convinced it happened yet. So they call in the man's parents. That's your son? Was he born blind? Yes, that's our son. Yes, he was born blind. Okay, how do you explain the fact that he sees now? And they're like... No thanks. You can ask him that question. Why don't they want to ask or answer the question? Look at what it says in verse 22. They say in verse 21, ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. And verse 22 tells us why. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, that is Messiah, the promised one, the anointed one, the Savior, he was to be put out of the synagogue. So even before the book of Acts, where the early church is persecuted for preaching Jesus, even before that, while Jesus is still ministering, there's persecution for those who would claim the name of Jesus. They will be excommunicated, they will be likely ostracized, they will be removed from their worshiping community, right? their synagogue, if they say that they believe Jesus is the Messiah. And so they're scared, and they're not ready to answer that question. So they put it back on their son. Now here's what all this means so far. Before we get to this last section. Jesus came to bring light to those in darkness. Not only physical darkness, but also spiritual darkness. Sin brings darkness. Sin breeds darkness. And if you are in darkness, Jesus can give you light. He can bring you out of that darkness into his kingdom of light. He can cleanse you. He can forgive you. 
He will love you. He will receive you. And that's what he is showing through this miracle. But he also, we also see here that following the light of the world, that following Jesus will come with a cost. You might be ostracized. You might lose friends. You might lose family relationships even. There might be people who say, if you believe that about Jesus, we've got no reason to hang out anymore. I'm not going to listen to it. I, I don't want to hear about it. Jesus said he came to divide people from their own families. Not because he wants to. He's just saying that's what's going to happen. Some are going to believe and some are not. And it's going to create a division. Some divisions are sad but necessary. Right? So he is the light. He's come to rescue those who are in darkness. But we also have to count the costs before we decide to follow him. Now, you ask anybody who has followed him, and here's what they'll tell you. It's absolutely worth it. It's absolutely worth it. But anyone who tells you, tells you, follow Jesus and your life will be perfect and happy and everything will go well and all that, they're not telling you the whole story. And they're not telling you the truth. Jesus will give you joy and peace, yes. But he also said, in this world you will have trouble. Both things are true. Now, after this exchange with the man's parents, we're just going to look at a couple more verses. It says, verse 24, So for the second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. They have, they are, have made up their minds. They're convinced that Jesus cannot be from God. He cannot be honoring God. They're convinced he's breaking the Sabbath. They've already made up their minds. And it sounds like they want this man to agree with them. But here is what he says, verse 25. Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. Again, this man hasn't spent much time with Jesus. He, he hasn't gotten, you know, much Christian education yet. He hasn't been taught much about who Jesus is. He hasn't spent much time around him. All he has is this one experience. So he doesn't know. We know Jesus is not a sinner. We know Jesus is the only one who's without sin. But what's most significant about this man's testimony is what he says in the second half of verse 25. He says, I don't know if he's a sinner or not. But one thing I do know, though I was blind, now I see. You can't argue with that. You can't contradict that. I may not have all the answers, but you cannot take away what Jesus has done for me. Those words... That he uttered, once I was blind, but now I see. We sing those words whenever we sing the hymn Amazing Grace, like we did this morning. Why do we sing those words? I wasn't born blind. I suspect neither were any of you. Why do we sing those words? Because the miracle is also parable because the miracle of the physical healing of the man born blind also tells us something true about what Jesus does for each and every Christian spiritually we may not have been physically blind but we were spiritually blind blind to the truth about who God is blind to the truth about who Christ is blinded by our sin, blinded by our rebellion. But though we were once blind to all that, now we see. 
And that wasn't something we could do for ourselves. God opened our eyes. The light of the world gave us light so we could see. So that we could see Jesus for who he is. So that we could see our sin for what it is and want to be rid of it. So that we can see Jesus for who he is and want to be with him, want to be near him. Recognize he's the only one who could save us, who could make us new, who could give us not only life, but light that lasts forever. We once were blind, but now we see. And to anyone who's still in the darkness, we invite you to come to the light of the world. And he will do the same for you.